Hello and welcome to Histories and Mysteries of Grove City College. I'm Hillary Walzak, the Grove City College Archivist, and you're here with me today in the Grove City College Archive. I'm going to walk you through some fun, fascinating stories of Grove City College history and some of the unique items that we house here in the archive and some of the history behind those items. Hopefully you'll be highly entertained and learn something new, but sit back and enjoy and have some fun with us today. To start off, I'm going to take us back to the 1800s to one of my favorite items here in the archive, hat pins. Some of you may already know what a hat pin is. If you don't, they were used to hold hats and veils on women's head. This accessory was primarily in the 1800s during the Victorian era. Early on, they were handmade throughout Europe and not as widely accessible. In the 1830s, a factory in the United States was able to mass produce them, making them more widely available. Also, going into the 1800s, leading more into the 1880s, 1890s, styles change, fashion starts requiring large hair, large hats. And with those large hair and large hats, you need bigger pins to be able to hold that to your head. At this time, some of your largest hat pins were going to be in the 12 inch range. That's huge. During this peak of 1895 to 1910, when you really see a lot of hat pins, is when you see a lot more of the middle class being able to afford the resources and accessorize more. So women had multiple hat pins for the different hats that they were wearing daily. Also during this time, the industrialization of enameling took place. And so you started having enameled hat pins. So here you have a Grove City College enameled hat pin. As we get more into the 1910s, you have the world going to war and you start seeing the decrease of hat pins and that's kind of when they phased out. But since we're really close to Halloween, I'll share some of the darker sides of hat pins. Dun, dun, dun. So obviously being as large as they are, you gotta be careful not to poke yourself with these. Um, in 1908, you had laws passed um, requiring the sizes to go smaller because they were afraid of women using them as weapons. There are lots of stories and articles, um, you can find them in the National Archives, Smithsonian Library of Congress, of women actually using their hat pins to defend themselves against assaults. Um, there are stories of them using them against assailants in public transportation and the streets. And so those laws in 1908 um, limited the length of those pins and brought them to be a little bit more small. Remember this time in history as well, it's the women's suffragette movement, and it's really gaining traction. So that law in 1908 was due to the fact that they were afraid suffragettes were going to start using them as weapons, and there's a lot of resources that actually suggest that that is why the law went into place. In 1909, you also had another law passed that required caps to be put at the ends of the hat pins to prevent any accidental injury. You can see here in this cartoon ad from the Smithsonian, that they did produce propaganda to show that you have to protect yourselves against these hat pins. Regardless of the laws, going into 1910s, you still saw a decrease in the size and the usage of hat pins, primarily because the world went to war. Resources became very scarce, and so women were making hats um, smaller, they were wearing them less, and their hat pins were becoming more homemade and smaller. We actually have one from this era in the archive. It's much smaller, as you can see, and it is actually made from a button, a Grove City College button from the military uniform that was used from the military training program here on campus during World War I. So that's kind of some of the fun, fascinating facts regarding happens. I'm going to stay in the 1910s for a little bit. During the 1910s, Grove City College faced a major change. They lost their first founding president, Isaac Cutler, in 1913 from appendicitis. This is just one year after we lost Joseph Newton Pugh, chairman of the board. So the college had a very large decision to make in terms of who was going to replace Isaac Cutler. Prior to his death, Isaac Keller had actually suggested someone, a close personal friend of his, to take on the role. The board unanimously voted him in, and he would come to serve at Grove City College as our second president. This man was Alexander T. Ormond. Ormond was already a close friend of the college. He had been coming for years to the Bible conference that took place every single summer. Here you see a picture of Isaac Cutler and 
Ormond in the Bible conference photo for the summer of 1910. He was a renowned Princeton philosopher who often attended the Bible conference during the summers, and he took on this role gladly. Um, he decided to expand the faculty and truly enhance the curriculum to make Grove City College more competitive, more on an Ivy League level. He's also known for bringing Greek life to campus. Prior to this, Isaac Kettler was adamantly against Greek life on campus and fraternal organizations. Although some groups were founded in secret, like Pansophic and Adelphicos, they were not recognized officially until Alexander T. Orman came into play. Alexander T. Orman is known for a pretty short tenure at Grove City College. He was only president for three years, dying in office from complications of diabetes. Something that's not often known is that he was close personal friends with Woodrow Wilson, the 28th president of the United States. Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson and Alexander Ormond went back quite a ways. They both attended Princeton and they were both professors at Princeton. While Ormond stayed on as the philosophy professor at Princeton, Woodrow Wilson became president of Princeton. They still remained friends. Woodrow Wilson also almost spoke at Grove City College because of this friendship. He connected with Isaac Kettler and sadly had to decline the offer to come speak at the college because although he doesn't say it in the letter, as you can see here, he was actually about to announce his candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Even as president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson and Orman stayed fast friends. He wrote a letter congratulating Ormond on his inauguration as president. It was printed in the Alumni Quarterly, the Collegian, as well as the Ouija in 1914 with letterhead from the White House. Another fun fact um, is that Woodrow Wilson Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan also spoke at Grove City College. Now William Jennings Bryan, you're probably thinking, I know that name. Although being uh, Secretary of State, he's also known for losing the presidency three times. But he did speak at Grove City College several times, and we have several letters that discuss payment, travel expenses, and dates that he's going to be arriving. So that's another fun fact of Grove City College history. Going back a little bit to Isaac Hetler and how adamantly he was against fraternal organizations, I'm going to talk about a secret society that was on Grove City College's campus in the early 1900s. For most Grovers, Greek life was something that was very common and a very positive experience for their college career, something that they come back to reunions for and enjoy being able to connect with those um, brothers and sisters from their Greek groups. But again, Isaac Hetler was adamantly against any fraternal organizations being formed on campus. So much so that his own son, Weir Cutler, didn't even join the Masons until after his father passed away. So in 1904, a secret society was discovered. And the threat to any group that was formed in secret was expulsion. And they weren't bluffing. In 1904, they expelled six students who were found being a part of the secret society called the Opossum Club. Included in the six people was the vice president of the college, J.B. McClellan's son, J.H. McClellan. So these six were discovered as a part of this kind of skull and bones type society. They had been at least in existence for about 12 years prior. Even after the expulsion, they continued on. Alumni of the college and community members helped to keep this group afloat. They ended up moving the headquarters down to Clifford Harshaw Real Estate on Broad Street, where they still remained in secret. The problem is, is we don't know what happens to them after a few years after the expulsion. Because by 1913, when Greek groups were allowed on campus, when you see Pansophic and Adelphicos finally being recognized as fraternities, the Opossum Club is no longer in existence. So we don't know what happened to the secret society at Grove City College. So I'm going to continue on with some of the kind of more mysterious things of Grove City College. One of the most frequently asked questions that I get for research in the college archive is, why was the yearbook called the Ouija? Isn't that a board game that talks and conjures spirits? Why would they ever name the yearbook this? Yes. It is named the Ouija, and yes, it was after the board game. So the Ouija, 1912, this is our first yearbook at Grove City College. This is the first year that they print class photos, clubs, sports, faculty, the administration into a yearbook. This becomes a very popular tradition in America at most colleges, high schools, um, institutions of higher learning. 
The yearbook maintained throughout the years. Um, it has been a huge tradition at Grove City College. While other schools have let it go to the wayside as their campuses expand, as the class sizes increase, as the digital era takes hold, Grove City College still prints a yearbook every single year. We have printed even during some of the most complicated and difficult years of Grove City College's history, like World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and a pandemic. So while it's a huge tradition, it was named the Ouija and then switched to the bridge. So I'm going to go over some of that history and kind of give you the background on why it was called the Ouija and why it wasn't something that was considered negative at the time in American history. So the term Ouija dates back to about 1891. That's our earliest usage and it is when the um, board that you can use to talk to spirits comes out. Now, at this time in American history, spiritualism was huge. This was the age of spiritualism, and it was not something that was considered negative, even with the Christian faith. So oftentimes people would maybe be having a seance on a Saturday and going to church on a Sunday. It was kind of one in the same. It was not viewed with any version of taboo. It was so popular that even Mary Todd Lincoln held seances in the White House after her son passed away from the fever. Um, spiritualism was something that kind of helped people handle some of the unknown of the time. Remember, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, infant and child mortality rates are very high. People are dying from every disease out there. There are no vaccines, and it is a scary, uncertain time. So they kind of use this spiritual seance in order to kind of give them some sense of closure, especially when they lost a loved one. Now, seances were something that were more difficult to take place, and when the Ouija board came out, it kind of gave society this easy, you could do it yourself at home type um, of avenue. Now, why was our yearbook called the Ouija? How, how does that come into play? So this is also a term that's used in the literary world. Um, books and poems, a lot of literature was kind of considered Ouija as a term of inspired work. So that is primarily why the yearbook is called the Ouija. It is inspired work. It is a spiritual um, inspired work of Grove City College's students. But it was frequently used and the Ouija board was somewhat part of why it was named what it was. It was a popular thing and a popular term. It wasn't considered negative really until you get into the 1970s. You see a huge shift in 1973 when the movie The Exorcist comes out, and that is because they use it and she's been possessed by a demon. So this negative connotation with the devil and demons comes into play really in the 1970s. That's when you start seeing a more negative connotation and more and more pop culture um, takes on this kind of mentality. So you start seeing a turn against it being something that was used for spiritualism and is now a negative taboo item. So going into the 80s, it's continuing to kind of be a negative term, and you start seeing a resurgence in the board game. And so that's when the college decided, you know what, I don't think this is the right thing for our college. It's not something that um, really represents us anymore, and it is no longer the term it used to mean. So that is when they decided to switch from Ouija to the bridge. So uh, 1982 is when you switch to the bridge. So if you see close up, Ouija, Ouija, and then it changes to the bridge. So here the students and the faculty, staff, and administration decided to pick a term that really resonated with Grovers um, through all generations. So the bridge is in reference to Rainbow Bridge, an iconic image for Grove City College, something that so many of us love and hold dear. Since then, the yearbook has been the bridge, and we have put out a new one every single year, including working on one for this year of 2020 and a pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, with the hat pins, Grove City College had a training program during World War I. We actually have a long-standing history of having military detachments on campus going back from the 1880s all the way to the 1980s, with some breaks in between. So starting back in the 1880s, Isaac Cutler realized that it was really important to have a military prep program on campus. So he contacted government officials and was able to get um, commanding officers to come to campus and train men in military prep. 
they ended up having uniforms that were West Point style uniforms, and they participated in several conflicts as well as inaugurations of presidents. During the Spanish-American War, many Grove City students and alums ended up partaking in this conflict in Cuba. Isaac Hitler was so concerned about his um, students and alumni that he actually contacted the major general in Cuba to see how they were doing. And here we have a letter of him getting a response from the major general in Cuba. Now the date on here is actually a few days before the conflict actually ends. You also have them participating in the inaugurations of two U.S. presidents. First, Theodore Roosevelt, where we actually have a thank you to Isaac Cutler for sending those military cadets for the inauguration parade, as well as William Howard Taft a few years later, participating again in the inauguration parade. After all these conflicts and the world pretty much being at what seems like peace, the interest really started to decline and the program ended. But when... Europe went to war in 1914 and World War I was becoming larger, Weir Kettler and the Board of Trustees really felt that the United States was going to end up going to war. So they contacted the U.S. government and they said, please let us have a military detachment and a training program here at Grove City College. They were told no because at the time the U.S. was still neutral. Knowing that again war was inevitable, they ended up creating their own program on campus, kind of a ragamuffin type team of military cadets with no uniforms and the training officers being from the Company M National Guard Detachment in Grove City. So many of the students already were a part of Company M, so it really did make sense. But in 1917, when the U.S. did declare war, we were first in line to ask for a military training program, and we were approved. An SATC program was put on Grove City College's campus, and the detachment barracks were put in Memorial Hall. With so many soldiers going overseas and individuals coming back, having lost many Grove City College alums and students over in World War I, and having over 500 serve during World War I, they brought back unique items from Europe and actually donated some of them to the college. So I am going to show you a few of the items we have from World War I that are very unique um, and special that were brought back from different alums. They were a part of our World War I exhibit a few years ago. So this first item that I'm going to show you is actually a little bit on the um, grotesque side in the sense that this is the canister. And here we have a World War I German gas mask. As you can see, it's not in great condition. I'm holding gloves so that I can kind of protect it as best I can. This just kind of shows and represents some of the horror that these men saw while they were overseas. But from all of this horror came some beauty as well. When the soldiers were in the trenches, they often needed to keep themselves busy, especially if they were waiting days before they did anything. Um, so they would make art. They made art out of things that were left around that they had near them, including belt buckles, any metal they found, coins. They would etch things, and this is called trench art. So here we have a piece of trench art that is from a shell casing. It's of a cathedral in France. And it has just gorgeous detail. So this is a piece of trench art that came from World War I and was donated to Grove City College from one of the individuals who served overseas. This next story is a really good one. It's so fun and it just was told to me recently. It is from an alum, Tom Thompson of the class of 1965 regarding his father while he was a student here at Grove City College in 1933. So this is about Rockwell Hall. Rockwell Hall, as some alums know it as Science Hall, as it was originally called, is kind of that focal point of our quad that was designed by the Olmsted Brothers firm, and it makes us a famous Olmsted campus. Rockwell Hall was built by W.G. Eccles out of Newcastle, and they're still in existence today. It is also known for its tower. Now, generations of Grove City College students have snuck up into the tower and signed their name or left a a handprint left some kind of marker of their time here at Grove City College. To any students watching right now, I do not suggest you go do this. It is not safe and you should not be doing it. But it is something that students have done for generations. Well, in the early 1930s, when Rockwell was brand new, 
Donald C. Thompson was a student here. He was an upperclassman and working as a lab assistant in the building. One day, a bunch of excited freshmen run down from the tower and come straight to him and say, there's an older guy in there breaking out the stained glass windows with a ball pen hammer. Being the senior, he goes to investigate, climbs up the tower and finds a very distinguished looking man with a coat and tie systematically popping out all the stained glass windows. The accused vandal was none other than J. Howard Pugh, the chairman of the board and major benefactor of the college, someone who had actually given quite a bit of money towards building this building. Pugh noticed the perplexed student standing there studying the scene and explained, people need to be able to see out this window. This is one of the most beautiful views on campus. And it is true. Anytime we've ever seen a photo taken from this area, it is just gorgeous. You can see straight down the quad, seeing the dorms on your side, the chapel, Crawford, the flagpole, and then going down to lower campus. And at this time, most of campus was on lower campus. So it's a beautiful shot. Um, but again, so Thompson, realizing who this man was, does not question the man who funded a good percentage of the building. And he climbs back down at the tower. And if you notice, Rockwell does not have stained glass windows in some of the areas. Uh, but according to the original plans of W.G. Eccles, there were supposed to be windows full of stained glass. Today, our freshmen are welcomed by the orientation board. They're smiling faces and fun activities that welcome students to campus. This tradition has been long standing at Grove City College since pretty much its founding. Um, where different activities and rituals take place to welcome these freshmen to campus. This is a common tradition at many colleges and universities. So if you go into a college archive at a different institution, you would probably see that there were some weird rules and some different outfits and things that they made freshmen do um, that really kind of welcomed them to campus. The purpose behind this was to help the freshmen meet each other, to say hello, to become friends, to get them outside of their comfort zone and meet one another, as well as to respect the upperclassmen. They were all given freshman handbooks that would give them the specific rules that they needed to follow for those first six weeks of school. This often included a specific dress code, um, women wearing skirts, white stockings, men wearing white shirts with black ties, and oftentimes they're dink. This little hat changed over the years. We have many different um, renditions of the jink. Our earliest one that we have is 1912. It's a purpley blue that says 12 on it. And you can see here in this picture, there's many different styles, colors, they change them up. In the 1930s, there was a bellhop style. This tradition continued until 1971. So some version of these traditions and rituals took place. You also had in the 1930s, they would also wear a black armband with their dinks. The girls had to wear their white stockings, like I had said, and black skirts. Boys were wearing um, white shirts with black ties. In the 1920s, the town girls had to wear green bows in their hair to designate that they were from town. They also had to learn dances and songs. They had to greet the upperclassmen. And later on, as many of our alums know, they had frosh signs with their names, hometowns, college room, and their RA or counselor. So many of our alums today still fondly remember their frosh signs that they had to wear. But again, this stopped in 1971. Anyone anyway, after that 1971 era, you lucked out not having to wear a dink in the frosh sign. Other rules that came in place with this was things like no smoking and no dating until Thanksgiving, and other rules that were given out in that handbook that was from the student government. Next, I'm going to talk about the plane that sat between Memorial and Lincoln Hall. For those of you who don't realize that there used to be a plane on campus, there was. And then for others, they're like, when did the plane leave? So Grove City College had a war training program during World War II, where thousands of servicemen came through the college campus, going through Marines, Navy, and Army Air Corps. Specializing in engineering, and we also had a secret radar program where we were one of six in the nation. 
To thank us for our service and efforts during the war, we had a victory ship named after us, the SS Grove City. Also to thank us, we were given one of the first detachments of the AF ROTC programs. Very similar to other ROTC programs, we had hundreds if not thousands of students go through this program and end up being an officer by the time they graduated. So our Vietnam veterans often started in the AF ROTC program. In the summer of 1957, a fighter bomber was placed on the lawn between Lincoln and Memorial. This was to be used as an addition to the training aids for the AF ROTC program, but it also served as a memorial to those who served during World War II and the Korean War. A plaque was put on the plane to thank them for their service and to honor them. The fighter bomber was set up in the quad between Lincoln Hall and Memorial. And the AFROTC cadets could use this cockpit and the instruments as part of their training. The engine was placed in the science building, Rockwell Hall, as we had talked about, for engineering students to be able to work with that as well. The airplane was manufactured by the Republic Aviation Corporation in 1951 during the Korean War, and it was an F-84G and was classed a fighter bomber designed to carry bombs, rockets, and heavy machine guns. The plane remained on campus as a training tool and a focal point until the AFROTC program disbanded in 1989. And last but not least, I'm just gonna end with a fun list of famous performers who came to Grove City College. In 1959, we had Louis Armstrong. Then we had followed up by the Kingston Trio Duke Ellington came. Here we can see a record of Duke Ellington that he was working on while he performed at Grove City College. In 1963, Dizzy Gillespie. In 1967, Simon and Garfunkel came to Grove City College. In 1968, The Shirelles and The Temptations. In 1972, we saw the eccentric performance of Alice Cooper where apparently feathers exploded in the arena all over the floor, becoming a nightmare for a housekeeping staff. 1973, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. 1974, Kansas. And then in 1977, Rush. So I'm going to end it there with some fun facts of Grove City College history. I've had a lot of fun today. Thank you for joining me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at collegearchives at gcc.edu. If you're on Instagram, check us out at GCC Archives, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Have a great one.